90% of the visits to a general practitioner were in were infectious disease, acute injury, and childbirth. But today, 90% of all visits to a practitioner are for an inflammation-related health disorder. Four electrons into the body via an electrode patch or just having them lay on a ground grounding mat, then those electrons are being absorbed by the body, equalizing with the earth. And once it reaches earth potential, you can't have inflammation in a grounded body. Certain uh, cancers, they go in, they develop within a pocket of inflammation, and then they get their own blood cell or supply and whatever. But if you can go in there and reduce the inflammation that's protecting it, then eventually the immune system will get to it. And what does an immune system do? It will reduce it. And it was the greatest day, one of the greatest days of my life, one of the worst days of my life, because I realized I had discovered something really important or something profound, let's say. And at the end of the day, I realized that I was the only person who knew about it. Hello, and welcome to the CNM Specialist Podcast. My name is Mike Murphy, and today I have the great privilege of interviewing Mr. Clint Ober, the founding father of what is referred to as the earthing or grounding movement. And if you haven't heard of earthing and its power to affect health in a positive way, then brace yourself because what you're about to learn could be life-changing, especially if you or someone you know suffers from a chronic inflammatory disease. Clint Ober is a humble man and his life story is so interesting. He comes from very modest beginnings and ends up building a hugely successful company and then at midlife suffers an illness that almost kills him in 1995. But he survives against the odds and decides to go on a mission to find a higher purpose. And my goodness, does he find it. He ends up discovering what many people consider to be the most important health discovery ever. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. This podcast and all our episodes are available on all the main podcast channels and also on the CNN website. So without further ado, Let's get into it. Well, a very warm welcome to you, Mr. Clint Ober. It's, it's just a great privilege to meet you. Well, thanks, Mike. I'm, it's really an honor and a privilege to be on your show, and I'm looking forward to the visit. Great. Are you, are you coming at us today from, uh, from Palm Springs, is it? Uh, yes, Palm Springs, California. All right. Beautiful. I've, uh, I'm originally from San Diego, California, but oh, um, oh, cool. I've never been to Palm Springs, so it's on my list. <laughs> Sunny and sun, well, sunshine uh, and warmth. Well, let me know when you're coming, and I'll make sure that you have a good time. Excellent. Okay, <laughs> great. Likewise uh, to, to London. Um, Clint, can I call you Clint? Yes, please. Okay, Clint, your, your discovery around earthing and its potential to human health is considered by many to be perhaps the most important discovery ever, and it's... It's huge and yet so simple in so many respects. Um, and of course, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of, of the science of earthing and, and what you've learned on your um, you know, journey of discovery in terms of how this benefits health. But I find your personal story so captivating. And I wonder if you would mind kind of sharing with us some of your early life experiences that, that kind of shaped the man, so to speak. Oh, okay. Well, that's pretty easy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it, um, it's a long story, and uh, but I'll I'll shorten it up here a little bit. Anyhow, I grew up on a, you know kind of a ranch farmland in Montana, and um, we raised cattle, and um, uh, and then we had to feed them, of course, all that kind of stuff. But forever taking care of livestock. But as a young as a young man, I I kind of you know, I was a cowboy. That's a, that, and that's not what you see in the TV or in the movies. It's a cowboy is somebody, a boy who sits on a horse and rides around the herd and just looking for a cow that's not, uh, that's not well or not, you know, making sure the cattle are happy and they're well. And, uh, and if you find one that is kind of glassy eyed or it's not, uh, like the rest of the herd, then you take them out of the herd, put them in a holding pen. Then you have to go check the water, test the water, um, 
ride the pasture, make sure there's no noxious weeds coming up, make sure the grass is not too short, uh, make sure there's not a dead animal upstream or something, because the concept is if, if you have a, a sick animal in the pasture, then something in the pasture is causing that problem. So if you keep the pasture clean and pristine, then you'll have healthy cows and you'll make a living. If you don't, if one of the animals gets sick, then, or if the animals get sick, then you have to call the vet and the banker at the same time. Wow. And just kind of toss the, toss the keys up and say, you guys own this, we're out of here, there's no way you can survive. So, but anyhow, so I, I have a, a, a background in prevention, meaning uh, you just grew up that way. I, so anytime there's something wrong with health, I mean, of, of my own health or the children or anyone, I say, what caused, in my back of my mind, a little voice says, well, what caused that? Mm, root you know, cause. What's going on? Well, looking for the root you know, cause. Yeah, what, what's going what's in the pasture? What's going on in the pasture? Mm. And, and oftentimes, what are you thinking about or whatever? What's causing this? Uh, because it's health is, the concept is health is natural. And that's how I grew up with the concept. Health is natural. It's the body's most natural state. Animals most natural state. And or if you if if you don't have health, then something is interfering with the immune system's ability to maintain health. Mm. It makes and a lot of so sense. it's just just a simple cowboy logic. <laughs> yeah, all the way. I'm not. <laughs> we've kind of lost that logic, I think, over the last you know hundred years or so. You know, largely as a society, <laughs> but it just makes sense. It's kind of at the core of you know we're coming at you from the College of Naturopathic Medicine, and that's at the very mm -hmm. core. Nature heals, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. I'm reminded of the gardener's analogy. You know, when a plant, you know. A plant suffers, you see the disease in the leaves, but it starts with the soil, you know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so anyhow, I, I kind of have always had that ingrained in me. It's just second nature to me. Uh, so prevention. And then and when I was young, the only magazine we had in the house was Prevention Magazine, which was a little, uh, you know, eat an apple a day and keep the doctor away. Mm. <laughs> that, yeah. that concept. Uh, in the early in the early days of prevention, and and then beyond that, I uh, uh, growing up, I had a lot of Native American friends, you know, and and back then they, they when I was young, they were still a lot of them were still living in teepees. Wow, what and, tribe? And yeah, the, the Crow and the Cheyenne. Okay. Uh, in in uh, north or uh, no southeastern Montana, and um, <clears throat> and then. Um, and, but anyhow, they uh, they look at the world completely different than Angola, and, uh, and especially back then. And it was about uh, they look at they're 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 a part of nature. They're not separate from nature. Angolo is more, you know, the world was made for us to do whatever we want with, and mm -hmm. so on. Native Americans are more like, you know, if you affect anything, you're affecting yourself. I mean. So it's that very earthy, very na nature. It's it just nature is the, the only word I can use to describe it. Mm. But but anyhow, as um, um, I, I remember a couple of stories growing up too that are relevant to this story here. Um, that when I was very young, I remember I came home from school one day and went out to one of my friends, um, and his sister had scarlet fever i believe it was scarlet fever and and they didn't have a lot of solution this is back in the 50s so they, 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 a lot of this, these diseases that we treat today were not treatable back yeah. then and um so anyhow she was very sick they'd been to the doctor and whatever but no hope and they didn't know what to do so i remember they they dug a little pit in the ground it was on not very deep but it, but again i was small then so i don't remember their mm. sizes and stuff but but it wasn't too deep, but anyhow, they dug a little pit in the ground, then they laid straw in the pit. And then one of the elders or one of the grandfathers built a fire not too far from the pit. And then they laid the girl in the pit and then he sat there or somebody sat there with her for a couple, three days. And, um, and eventually we came home from school one day and here she was up running around like everybody else. And <clears throat> so that always puzzled me. You know, I never had any understanding of it or explanation of it uh, until 
I much until I get further down the road here when I was doing the earthing and stuff, then I learned a lot of these that a lot of the indigenous cultures around the world uh, bury their you know, people are sick, they bury them in the earth. Mm. And, you know, and I didn't know why <laughs> I do now. <laughs> wow. Um, but um, <clears throat> so and then there was another time I was walking into one of the um, homes of a, of a Native American and the, and the grandmother said, take your shoes off, they'll make you sick. Had not a clue what that, <laughs> why would anybody tell me to take my shoes off? Yeah. But we always like to be barefoot anyway, especially after school, lose the shoes. And, and all the time growing up, um, the only time we wore shoes is when we were in the field and there's a lot of hard stubble or something, or um, uh, go to church or, you know, to a, a wedding or something like that, you had to wear shoes. But beyond that, we would lose the shoes. I mean, we wouldn't wear shoes when we were. And again, this is early 50s. Mm. And um, and not only that, shoes were made of leather. And if they got wet, then you went home. Your mom would get mad at you because when they dry out, they, they get gnarly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hard. hard to come back from that. <laughs> yes. And... Yeah. Um, so and so if it rained or if it was wet, you had to take the shoes off and carry them uh, and carry them home. Wow. <laughs> but barefoot was pretty natural. I mean, but again, I was in the hinterlands of, you know, I, I wasn't um, living in New York City. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny, you wonder how, how that grandmother kind of had figured it out early on, you know, that these well, shoes yeah. make you sick. Well, that I had not a clue. I yeah. kind of have a better clue now, but it was, but the, but she was Native American, and uh, um, they're very earthy people. Mm. You know, it's really, and it, and it, it had a, an impact on me growing up. Was yeah. they didn't really understand ownership, how you can own a tree, or how you can own land, or how you can own the water. <laughs> Water belongs to everybody, you know. Um, but but the Anglo is just the opposite. They'll kill you if you come, if you step onto their land or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And um, <clears throat> but uh, but anyhow, so so there's a whole different philosophy. That's why they never could come to terms with each other because it's just they didn't speak the same language. They didn't. And but but I always identified with them because there's something natural there, something very earthy, and it just called me and growing up we had fun we played together we we you know i i, I was not too far from custer battlefield and everybody's heard of the custer you know custer yeah. general custer yeah <laughs> but uh, but i was the white boy so uh, i was general custer so i've been killed a hundred times oh my so. gosh <laughs> and, and and they accepted you they didn't see you as you know no you know the white no, man no and... no you know when you're when you live together and you acclimate to each other and you and and we were boys we were out camping and you know whatever we would go kid go snow cave and uh, stay in snow caves in the winter just for fun and go snare rabbits and eat all of it fix our own food we didn't need to take anything with us we could live off the land because we knew how to do that oh wow uh, but not forever ever but we could go out and camp for a couple three days and 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 we always had food. We never went yeah. hungry, but we weren't into. Yeah, we would build fires. We, I mean, we would do everything. You know, build caves, and dig caves into the side of the cliffs down by the river, and so on. Yeah, sounds like <laughs> great fun. It's on my bucket list. You know, learn how to survive off the land for a period of yeah. time. Anyway, my uh, yeah. my sister discovered recently that I'm uh, I'm related to Daniel Boone. Oh, okay. Um, and, you know, seventh, well, yeah. seventh great grandfather, or uncle, or something. Right. Uh, but well, the frontier, it's, in, it's in your, it's in your blood. Exactly. <laughs> Just <laughs> do what comes naturally. Exactly. It's there. It's 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 in all of us. Yeah. Exactly. And, exactly. So, yeah. so what a what a childhood. And then, um, Clint, I, I, you, I understand you had you had to grow up pretty fast. Yeah. You had a... Yeah. My father died when I was fourteen. Uh, he died from leukemia. And um, <clears throat> as a result, uh, I was—I think I was 14, something like that. And uh, I dropped out of school because 
my mother was having it was very challenged at that time also because she had uh, six kids and had lost her husband and yeah. you know had livestock in the field and uh, or in the uh, you know and crops in the field and, and and just all those things that had but being a 14 year old boy I knew how to do everything so uh, and you don't go go to school and come home and then take care of all that you have to, it's a full time job. Yeah. Were you the oldest sibling? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was okay. the oldest. Right. And and um, so I, I pretty much dropped out of school and I went to um, uh, went on to take care of the family businesses, you know, for a few years until my mom could stabilize and then we ended up eventually moving into the city. Um, <clears throat> but at that time, I you know I. When you're out there living like that, you don't think anything about it. You just, there's so much to do, and there's and you're responsible for taking, making sure there's food. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 so I remember one time I, one of my relatives came out for a weekend, or a bunch of my cousins and so on, and one of my aunts said, "Well, you know, you need to get back to school because otherwise you'll be a ditch digger the rest of your life." And I remember my grandfather; he was sitting there in a. Um, rocking chair they brought him out also and he was sitting there and uh, everybody kind of went away and he called me over and he said he says you need to remember one thing he said there's a library down the street anything you don't know go down there there's a book and it'll ta tell you anything you want to know and he said then if if you can't find what you're looking for he said then there's somebody out there who does know <clears throat> find them pay them whatever their price is and have them teach you what you need to know. And he says, you'll do just fine. <laughs> wow. And Great so, advice. but I, I spent, I, I took that to heart and I learned what I needed to learn along the way. Um, and I was kind of a loner because, you know, if you don't conform to what everybody's doing, then you're kind of an outsider and farm boys were different anyway yeah um and they didn't get to play in the sports and all the things at school and so it's so only how I, I and then i remember one time i was in in class too about that age just when all this was going on and i i said something wrong to a teacher i don't know if i said something wrong but she asked me to put my hands up on the desk and she was going to get a ruler and smack me on the on the fingers. And I said, you're not going to do that. And I got up and I walked out and I never went back. I never wow. went back. But this was about the time my dad had died yeah. and everything. I just didn't have time for the nonsense. Yeah. And, yeah, and so anyhow, that's kind of, it gives you a, a little bit of a background. Wow. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. And, and, and so somewhere along the line, you, you got, kind of you you got bit by the bug and you you needed to kind of go to the big city maybe leave the farm well uh, yeah it's a, but the big city was you know in montana those are all small cities okay <laughs> <laughs> at that time it's i think montana was the second or third largest state in the union at that time maybe the third uh, and and there was only like 300,000 people oh wow a lot of space <laughs> And I think there's now only a million or so. So it's a big state and it's, it's very rural. And uh, anybody that's seen Yellowstone on TV, you know, the uh, Netflix, yeah. Yellowstone, those kind of movies kind of gives you a picture because that's Montana. It's big, wide open, and it's mostly tourists. Cattle have been all moved to California and put in feedlots. Wow. And um, so the world's different, you know. Um, and then, yeah, back then the milk was sweet. And then when you go to the city, it wasn't sweet anymore. There was something mm -hmm. wrong with the milk because they pasteurized it. Right. right. You know, they, they killed, they killed. That'd the, kill it. Yeah. And then they, um, and then the meat was, you know, kind of a, had more taste to it and it was tasted good, you know, but when you go to the big cities then the meat is different, it's overcooked or it's whatever. You know, it's, it's, when you come from eating off the land, eating live bed, live food, you know, you go collect the eggs in the morning before you cook them, yep. you milk the cows, you do all this stuff while you're living in nature. I mean, you are part of the, the whole system. And so everything is tasted different, but it's alive. There's an aliveness there that mm. our food today is pretty much dead. Yeah. 
and it's, so we don't have that energy and um but i miss it and uh, so today it's really you know you don't drink milk anymore you don't do those things um wow we um we did an episode recently uh on raw milk and went to an organic biodynamic farm and uh -huh. um you know i've had a a cow's milk intolerance for much of my life and i just avoid mm -hmm. it you know i get congested yep. almost instantaneously uh -huh. and um and we you know after the filming was done I, I bought a pint of this amazing milk conventional milk comes from thousands of animals it's stored in tanks eventually pasteurized right. mm. and you know that story but this milk came from daisy She's never known stress. She's only eaten clover and grass. And, right. and um, I took it home and of course you got to make some, you know, chocolate chip cookies. I out of the oven, downed a whole glass of this and waited for the congestion and waited and waited mm -hmm. and it never happened. So, exactly. You know That's I mean? just, I, I, I can't, I totally understand. I, I'm totally yeah. on board with that. Yeah. And it's a real challenge when you live out, when you, when you, when you, move to the city and you adapt that lifestyle. I mean, it's just really, really challenging. Yeah. But absolutely. most people don't, will never know. Yeah. Most people will never know. Nope. That's, that's right. That's yeah. right. So, um, so, so then, you know, what, what was your entry into the, the, the cable TV industry when that first took okay. off? Well, living in Montana, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> what they call a one horse or two horse town, but you, you, you would have one TV station like in Helena, or you'd have two, you know, in, in like Billings, uh, and one was right, one was left. And then, then, and we had Anaconda Copper and the, you know, the big corporate uh, influences and politics and everybody was right and left. And, and it was kind of all about the craziness of politics and so on. But anyhow, when, <clears throat> um, in in the early days in cable, first of all, people didn't have any television. So in some cities, they had to put an antenna on top of a mountain and try to pick the signal up from, you know, 30 miles away or whatever. And and then they would run a wire up to the mountain, put it on an antenna, and then run it down. And um, there's archaic ways of doing cable. Then you just pointed an antenna in the city, and then everybody got it. And then they decided to pay and wanted everybody to pay for it. So then you had to start running wire to everybody's house. So anyhow, I kind of grew up, you know, um, from the very beginning of cable. But the thing I that immediately appealed to me about cable was when I was living in Billings, then all of a sudden we could bring Helena TV signals down to Billings via microwave and and then eventually distributing cable then great falls and then we could bring casper wyoming up to uh, montana and all of a sudden you could see that the world is bigger than billings montana mm -hmm. it was bigger than these tv stations and and one newspaper and wow. and a couple you know so all of a sudden your your world opened up and you could and and then eventually, uh, Ted uh, Ted Turner, <clears throat> you know, we, they, they were able to uh, put WTBS up on uh, up on a satellite, and receive that in Billings, Montana, in Missoula, Montana, and so now we could get the Braves. And but it wasn't so much the sports and that. What it was really about is you could see a bigger world. Mm. You you had you had wow, the world's much bigger, and these people do things differently. They're not like you know and it wasn't that it was good or bad it was just like eye opening and then all of a sudden then we had you know uh, i forget the names of the station the ID, the ID numbers but we had you know LA uh, and then uh, all of a sudden you um uh, started having local channels you could create your own uh you know uh, you you know, there were, a lot of them were character generated. A lot of them were uh, town hall meetings. And all of a sudden, the world just started. And I just fell in love with this concept. And I could see the future because, <clears throat> I mean, back then, we only had six channels, eight channels, eventually 12 channels. And then all the technology advanced, and we had 20 channels. And then we learned that satellites were stationary. And we could bounce TV signals off of them. 
And mm -hmm. so, you know, we can then bounce a signal from, you know, Atlanta to Missoula, Montana. And, and that world changed. Wow. And then, so, so I, I, it's, but, but the, what you see, it isn't that you have more to see on TV. It's that you get to see the rest of the world. You're exposed to a bigger, a bigger world. And it's, it just like opens your oyster up. <laughs> yeah. It's kids. Completely... And there's a lot of, a lot of, I was sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You know, just oh. think of kids today. I mean, you know, they have yeah. no concept of this, you know, isolation just right. the world is no anywhere in the world is available like that yeah and, and, and that's the beauty of it and that's what drew me in because i i just wanted to be a part of the world i didn't want to be a part of some political or local craziness yeah and um and and so i fell in love with that and and i got involved with it and that's what i wanted to to do and so i i you know i grew up in the early communications industry, translator TV, you know, uh, you know, low power TV, cable television and uh, microwave. And, and in fact, I was one of the, in the eighties, um, uh, early eighties, somewhere back in there, late seventies. Um, <clears throat> I fell in love with the, with the computer, but the problem was nobody knew what to do with it back then. I would buy everything that came on the market and I'd take them home. The kids would play games with them, Commodore 64, you know, all of them and the apples and, and whatever and the little PCs and, and, you know, you'd run checkbooks or whatever and you got, that got old real quick and yeah. <laughs> nobody's going to do that. And then the, most of the computers ended up in the closets. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so I, I, I remember opening the door one day and I, one of these computers, I was looking at it and I said, you know, that's a TV set without a signal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and I knew how to uh, take, you know, signals. I mean, or, you know, that's what we did with broadcast, import signals and redistribute them and, and so on. So I was involved with AP and UPI back in those days for a little bit. Uh, because we had some character generated news channels that they fed us and and i thought about it and then i i contacted tv data and then i said well you know we can put all this stuff in a unified data stream and 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 feed it you know over the cable system to a pc and and then i thought well no let's make it really something exciting so i went and got tas you know, from Russia, China, or Xinhua from China, Kaido from Japan, all, all these old, I mean, these very slow, archaic news wires, put them in a unified data stream in Boulder, Colorado. Task came in on 75 baud phone line. <laughs> Gives yeah. you an idea. Yeah, so we put them all in a unified data stream and then uh, scheduled them and it had a broadcast scheduler so that, you know, something that was four bells, five bells, whatever, it would go out immediately, something that was lower, would go out, you know, once every 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So it was kind of a, a, a data stream. And so then we created a little piece of software that you could read the data stream at your home. So we had to create a DMOD <clears throat> and, and then we converted the, you know, back down so that you could read it on, a, on your little Apple. Mm. And then you could type in the keywords, put in your stock quotes, put in your, if you're into sports or whatever, and then you could, get sports from around the world yeah you know any any news any news stringer that would put anything on the wire service well it would come through <laughs> yeah i remember home. when this was all happening you know i i i started my kind of adult working life in the pc industry in the early 80s okay working uh -huh. for a little, yes. little company called k pro i don't know if you yes you, i you i, remember I owned a k i remember k pro yeah yeah, yeah they, they were from my <laughs> all the little discs Yes, exactly. Yeah, all, Those all little that. floppy disks and things. They were yeah, from my hometown. Yeah. And so, you know, I eventually ended up in sales. But but early on, I was a technician working in, in their repair department. And um, oh, cool. I remember awesome. back then wearing a, a wrist strap to not blow up yes. the chips, you know, from static yeah. electricity. Little did I know, I spent all day kind of grounded, you know. You were, um, yes. You know. Yep. But, um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so I remember when that was all happening and was that kind of the the precursor to the cable modem that was well a yeah you had to, we had to develop the cable modem in order yeah. to uh, convert um, data to 
analog whatever yeah. you know all of the things that went on yeah we had to create the, we created the first modem to uh, convert uh, the data back to uh, i don't remember all the damn terms anymore but but anyhow so <clears throat> yeah we had uh, a little box that we created and so we would plug the cable into the back of it and it would convert it back to data and then you connect that to the pc and then you'd have your little software that we sent you and then you could pick out your stock what quotes you or wanted. whatever it was, your TV, favorite TV show, anything you wanted. Yeah. And then the data stream would be flying by and it would just pull off. So you were creating your own mini newspaper. Yes. I absolutely loved it. The thing I loved most about it was <clears throat> you could see all these stringers around the world that are out there collecting news and whatever. But 90% of anything that a stringer ever brought in was ended up on the cutting room floor mm. to make space for advertising. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the world. Money. And so, but anyhow, so I, I love this idea of being able to give all the information to all the people all the time. I fell in love with that. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I was talking at a cable convention up in Canada, and I think Trudeau was there. And, and I said, one day, the poorest person standing in a rice paddy in China is going to have access to the same information as the wealthiest guy on Wall Street. And it's all going to be because of satellites and personal computers. And everybody thought I was kind of nuts. I this bet. is back in the early early 80s. I <clears throat> but I could see it. But you yeah. could just see it. You're not going to stop it. Yep. And today we cannot stop this technology. This technology is there's something bigger than all of us. It's something about all of us. And we're all doing this together. Yep. It's, a, it's a global brain of some kind that we're creating. Yeah. Um, and it's an intelligence that's got a life of its own. And so I, I just, I, I know what it is. I can't put it in words, but there's a synergy amongst all of us. Then this is all coming. Uh, there's some good, there's some bad, there's some ugly, there's some beautiful, there's all of these things, but that's what life is all about. It's not that something's good or bad. It's all of this needs to be available, available to everybody. That's, I've always had that background. Well, that's it. That's a good attitude to have. And um, yeah. so you ended up building um, quite a successful company, yes, before you got out of Cape. Yeah. Yeah? yeah, in the early days, you know, I, I'm a, I, I, I loved being a part of helping build the industry. I mean, helping build the new things that we needed in order to expand it. But I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I, once something becomes a, you know, a, you know, a business and people go to work at eight and come home, whatever, then I kind of lose interest. I like to be on the edge on the, you know, the challenge. You know, I was there when we started home box office. I was there when we started all these different channels and, and I was a piece of it. It, did, it wasn't smart enough to own all of it, you know, <laughs> but I, but I knew what, I knew what needed to be. I knew that you know, I, I, I just knew what the public wanted. I knew what needed to be on Main Street. And so I was a pioneer and challenger. I mean, I tried to challenge the industry and let's go for, you know, serving, let's create more channels. Let's do more things for people. But un, unfortunately, the corporate America discovered the power of cable television. They went crazy. They they went like a bunch of drunken sailors. Wow. They came in and bought up everything and took over everything. And... <clears throat> And what we all, the early pioneers, a lot of the people that were involved in, we saw, you know, <clears throat> science channels, health channels. We saw all these different things. And so there, we saw narrow casting, meaning there could be a channel for everything, for every school, for every grade, for anything and everything. That's what we saw. But corporate America saw a different, right. and, you know, come in, build it up. And, don't do narrow. And <laughs> they, uh, do, do sell advertising, you know. And there's nothing wrong with advertising. You have to have it. But <clears throat> but we saw something. So it built the industry with something different. Um, but today we're, and it's interesting now, cable is disappearing. Mm. I spent my whole life building something that is now disappearing. But what we did is we created the infrastructure. So now you have the internet being fed to you by cable primarily. Yeah. By the cable system. Mm. So, so it all, everything evolves, everything, nothing stays constant. Everything evolves, everything grows. And that's what I loved about that industry. I, and I, I just can't say enough about wow. the fun and the excitement of mm. creating. 
and it's, all of that. It's great to be a part of uh, that that growth, you know, I, I feel that way about the, the PC industry, you know, and now, of course, yes. I think everybody has more compute power in their hand than existed in the world <laughs> in like 1972. Um, it, you know. True. <laughs> but, but I was standing on my front porch the other day looking at all these phone telephone poles with wires going into every single house. And I was thinking, I wonder if I knocked on the door, how many people actually are taking this signal and doing anything with it? Or is it all coming in through through fiber? you know and we have yet we have these telephone poles that are just sitting there you know dead well in a lot of cases that's true <clears throat> and um it, you it takes years to take everybody off of our landline and convert them to fiber or whatever the yeah. new mechanism is wireless and all these things so there's a transition you know 10 20 30 40 years sure because uh, some people just won't change. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and everything, you know, technology grows at the death rate. Yes, um, <laughs> they say that about science as well. You know, science progresses one funeral at a time. It does. Uh, it is. I learned that one too. Yeah, I want to um, get into <clears throat> that um, actually. Um, yeah. So 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 then there you are, um, fast forwarding to kind of. I guess what was the the end of your cable TV career? Um, right, top of the mountain, and and you had a, mm -hmm. a, a serious health crisis. Yeah, can we talk about? Yeah, that? it was pretty. Yeah, it was really interesting. I was I think I was fifty years old. You know, back then we're playing. You know, young men were all playing King of the Mountain. Mm. <laughs> you know, competition and who's the win, who's going to be on top, and who's going to outsmart who. And um, especially in the when you have a tight industry like that, and but anyhow, when I was 50 years old, I went to a dentist and I had a root canal placed or a mm -hmm. tooth fixed root canal. <clears throat> and about a month later, I started getting very sick, and I didn't put there was no connection between the tooth or anything, yeah. except the pain went away. That was good, um, <clears throat> but the. Uh, I kept getting sicker. I, I went to the doc and they ran some tests and it was around the holidays. And back then there was a lot of Christmas parties and I attended a lot of them because of business. And there was a hepatitis going around uh, and they thought, well, that's what it is because, uh, and they started running the test and, not, and, and the results come back. Uh, they, well, it's not that. And then, so they run more tests a week later. And so about three or four weeks into it, I was getting very sick. And one morning I got up and, and I lost my stability and my skin was really turning yellow. And so I went to the emergency room and eventually after a few hours, they put me in a CAT scan and found that I had an abscess in my liver, a huge abscess in my liver. And they actually went in and drained it while I was in the CAT scan. And uh, they took a big long nail, wow. stuck it in the ribs and you know, pulled it out. and. But anyhow, my liver was really damaged. I didn't know anything of this at the time they did this. But the next morning, the doc came in, and it was an infectious disease doc because he didn't. Know, they didn't know what was wrong with me because it wasn't. I didn't meet most of the test. But anyhow, so then he said, "Well, we got the good news, and we got some not so good news." And the good news was they found out what was wrong. <clears throat> that uh, I have an abscess in the liver. And it's most likely, and the first thing they asked me if I had been bitten. I said, no, no, nobody had bitten me or anything. And they said, well, and so I said, I did have some dental work. And they said, well, there's probably a relation, uh, meaning that when you have some of that work done, sometimes um, <clears throat> if they don't get all of it, then the bacteria will get into the bloodstream. Yep. And then <clears throat> if you're a young man at, at the holidays and probably drinking too much and doing crazy things, your immune system is compromised and this got into your system, your immune system wasn't able to handle it. And so it ended up becoming an abscess. And they said, <clears throat> and so the bad news is your liver is uh, pretty much destroyed. And it was the main lobe of my right side. And, um, <clears throat> And they said, um, there's not, you're young enough to get a new ling, uh, liver. You're healthy enough to get a new liver. You're not an alcoholic or anything. And uh, they said, but the problem is you don't have time to wait to get on a list because too much damage had been done. Wow. 
<clears throat> and they said, uh, so you need to go home and get your house house in the or house in order and whatever, and to come back in a, in in a bit. So they sent a nurse to the house once a day. I was on every IV in the world. Oh and then one day, a young surgeon from, I think it was Swedish Medical Center in Denver called. Their, his office called and said <clears throat> they wanted to do um, some experimental surgery. Just go in and cut out all the liver that is bad and see how much they could take out and save what you know the, what was next to the main artery coming in. Mm. And <clears throat> I said, well, I've got nothing to lose. <laughs> and it was still like I've been hit by a semi, you know. Wow. At 50 years old, you go from, you know, being somebody and then all of a sudden you're <laughs> And being nobody in your life, you know. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so anyhow, I, I ended up getting the surgery. They went in and cut out, I think it was like five sixths of the, my main lobe, because there's six little pockets that grew through evolution, whatever. Yeah. And so they saved the one that was connected to the main artery coming in. And <clears throat> I remember they cut me open, put the liver up there. I didn't see all this, but I saw some of the video afterwards. And then they go in and cut it, open the sack that's holding all of it, cut it open, take it out, put that little sack back around everything, threw it back in there, sewed me up. That's all they could do, you know. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, <clears throat> so anyhow, I went home and it took me about, I'd say, a week just to be able to get to the bathroom. I had no energy to speak of. Mm -hmm. And then so every day I would walk just a little bit further, a few more steps, and within... Probably six months, I was able to walk a mile, but I had to work at it every single day. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> and I would stand there and and do whatever exercises just to get try to get my strength. Like I was fighting for my life, you know. Gosh. And um, <clears throat> But anyhow, so then six months later, they went in, measured my liver. My liver grew back 100% in size. Wasn't the same. Didn't have all those little pockets, but it was one... It grew back to the same size that it originally was, which was remarkable. Isn't that incredible? So at the at age fifty, I had a, the equivalent of a brand new liver. Gosh. <laughs> so, and and, so and literally I, they, they and 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 that's just that just blows my mind. I mean, in terms of function today, when you measure your liver enzymes, and it's it's hundred percent all normal. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? They said I could never. They said I could never have that surgery again. <laughs> But <clears throat> I see. Uh, fair enough. But yeah, <clears throat> I said, well, I'll take care of this one. God, I don't drink. I don't. I don't do anything. But no, my liver enzymes are at. Oh, and I'll be seventy nine in a couple of months. Wow. Uh, I have my blood markers are all pretty much healthy. So you, it's kind of like a transplant in in some respects, except it's your own tissue. Um, yes. You know, the the liver is just one of these mission critical organs that just blows my mind you know it's got yeah. the cells of the liver have over 500 functions that they do for us yeah. uh, <laughs> of course from metabolizing nutrients and detoxification to bile production yeah. and protein synthesis and and storage of micronutrients as well so i'm not surprised right. you were just barely able to right you know walk i was i was on my way out I mean, you know, before and then when i came back there was just no energy whatsoever. I wasn't sure I was going to live. <clears throat> and they weren't either for a while, but mm. it just, every day, more energy. Wow. Every, <clears throat> and I'll tell you a little secret. I don't want to waste time. You can edit some of this out. <clears throat> but what, back then, I, <clears throat> there was a 7-Eleven type coffee shop about a mile from the house. And it was the only, it was the closest thing. <clears throat> and I just had this, I needed sugar. I needed uh, sugar. And so I had this craving. I wanted one of those glazed donuts. Mm. And it took me almost six months to be able to walk that mile in order to get one. <laughs> and I, before was, I, always, I always had that donut in my mind. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get wow. there. Uh, but it was so funny. But <clears throat> and it's funny what we use <laughs> in order to motivate ourselves. But But I did get there. And I remember I had to call and get a ride home that day. But but um, yeah. Wow. So it was just fun, funny. Wow. That's all. And and uh, obviously, uh, the fact that you survived, you know, life changing experience, and 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 so you you made a few changes at that point. Well, yeah, I I was home for a few days, and I lived in a five thousand square foot 
A-frame home. It was more like a ski lodge. It was two bedroom. Nice. <laughs> And it was on top of a mountain, Stanley Mountain in Evergreen, Colorado. And you could all see all the way to Vail and all the way to Denver. And and I collect. And, and the reason I had such a big house because I collected Western art. I had a huge collection of Western art. <clears throat> and um, so anyhow, all of a sudden I was looking at. I was laying in bed and I was looking at one of these beautiful paintings that I had, and it was a huge painting at the end of the bed. And I was looking at it, and all of a sudden, it just hit, struck me cold. You know, well, what would have happened to all my belongings had I died? I mean, it just, it just really a big chill went through me because nobody would have realized why I bought that art or why I collected it or the artist or any of the things that I were meaningful to me. They wouldn't have meant anything to anybody because most of those artists, a lot of them were dead. And a lot of them were, you know, yeah. popular, but still, unless you're involved, you don't know. <clears throat> so then uh, all of a sudden, uh, and then I kind of had this, and I, I remember I was looking out the window afterwards, and, and I looked out the window and all, and everything was a more, the colors were more vibrant, the, the pine needles and the blue sky. The blue sky was vibrant. The pine needles were like they were vibrating green. I mean, it was kind of more energetic, and I didn't really know what that was about. But, <clears throat> but I just remember I was in this kind of a state, and then all of a sudden I realized that, man, um, I had bought this house, done all these things, collected all these things, and I almost died. And and I just, I said, you know, I never really owned any of this stuff because this stuff's still here. You know, I I bought it. I built this big house i did all these things in order to take care of all of my personal belongings they get to stay and i get to go <laughs> yeah you know <clears> and nobody your native american care. roots you know uh, you don't own anything yeah. Yeah. you don't own anything and um uh, and you're certainly not going to take it with you <laughs> yeah and, and so i just had this cold chill go, go through me so i had this immediate aversion to owning thing i did not want to own anything after that moment and I remember calling the kids and telling them, I said, you guys need to come and take whatever you would have taken had I died. And they all thought I was nuts and whatever. I said, I'm very, I'm serious. You need to come and take all your belongings out of this house and whatever pieces of art you all put your name on, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and and then um, I did. In about 30 days, I had gotten rid of most of my belongings. And this was a big house. And I gave so much away, and um, but I didn't want to own anything because uh, I just I couldn't. I didn't want to. I just my body would say no. Mm. And so I let go of everything that I owned, including a company that had a few hundred employees. I pretty much gave that to them, and <clears throat> I just wanted my freedom from everything. I wanted to. And then the other thing that went through my mind is when I died, or when I felt like I was going to die before that surgery, a lot of pain. And I remember I had a couple of images of Native Americans that one of, in my youth that I, kind of came to me, some of the elders and stuff. I don't know where they came or why, but um, but anyhow, so I just had that earthy feeling or drawn to that culture. And um, some of the things that were meaningful to them became more meaningful to me, I guess, at the mm -hmm. time. <clears throat> so anyhow, then I... Um, I ended up buying a small motor home and I took two and a half suitcases of clothing and a few small things, mementos I didn't want to let go of, but everything else I sold, I gave away, I did whatever. And including I just, the house? Including the house, yeah. And so all for the first time in my life, I was free. I felt that I was free. Wow. I didn't have to go home. I didn't have to go to the office. I didn't have to make payroll. I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was find an RV park. <laughs> and, 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 and I spent almost four years traveling around the United States after that. Wow. And most of it was in national parks. I, I love being in national parks in the U.S. And um, what, was your, what was your first and, stop? Uh, I my first stop was in uh, uh, Missoula, Montana, visiting one of my kids. I was, 
at the time, where was I at the time? You know, I was in Denver. So I uh, immediately went up to Missoula. I had to spend a weekend or two with the kids. And then I went <clears throat> slowly across the United States into Michigan, saw a few more kids. In Pontiac, Michigan, they got one of the most beautiful state parks ever. Wow. Uh, so you, there's oh, a lot yeah. of treasures, you know, in yeah. state parks and national parks. And <clears throat> so I would just, that was what I was interested. In. That's what made me feel good. And people who camp out or are in tra- in in that same living environment, they're they're different. <laughs> you know, they yeah. they 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 don't own a lot of stuff, and they're they're travelers and whatever, or campers, or they just want to be in nature. <clears throat> so I was I felt a little more at home. So then and then I went around the United States, and then I went halfway around again. And I I ended up down in about four years later. I ended up down in Key Largo, Florida on the bay side <clears throat> beautiful sunsets every night and um, i loved that place i mean the, the manatee would come up and and you take fresh water hose and feed them a little they love fresh water mm. and <clears throat> and then you could see all the sea life out there you know the lemon sharks and so on coming by and beautiful and then the sunset would come down but it was kind of when you're looking there you're not seeing any power lines you're not seeing any human i mean you know human homes and all that kind of stuff and so it's like you're in nature and and i remember that one night i was sitting there this had been four years after i had left left colorado <clears throat> and i was sitting there and i had this kind of an earthy feeling you know it's like and and, <clears throat> and when you grow up on a ranch or when you grow up on animals you're you you get this earthy feeling like you're kind of this is all a system we're all part of it and yeah. it's all one thing but and so i felt like the earth was talking to me mm. i mean a lot of people think i'm nuts it's okay <laughs> at my age i don't care but but anyhow but i i felt like i had this something was happening mm. and so i went into the rv that night and i wrote it on a piece of paper just on a yellow pad I said become an opposite charge had no idea <clears throat> what it was about or where it came from just did then a few months later then i wrote down you know status quo is the enemy so this came out of nowhere and i just set it aside didn't think too much about it sat down on the couch and probably went to sleep i don't remember and <clears throat> woke up in the morning and was there and didn't think too much about it. but then all of a sudden i had this feeling that i really had to get back west and i really so i packed up everything went up to see one of my kids in Tennessee, and then I had deadheaded to LA, got there, said, I can't live here, can't be here, <laughs> went back to Tucson. I thought that's more cowboy, that's more me. So I stayed there for a bit and I said, no, it's not right. So I went, I said, I wanna to go to Flagstaff, Arizona because they have the pine trees, they have the snow, that's like home in Montana. Mm. And I went, so I headed up to Flagstaff and halfway up, uh, there was, I, it was getting late at night, around 10 o'clock, <clears throat> and there was a little road sign with an RV sign. And I said, well, I'm tired. I'm, in, I'm just going to go wherever that is, spend the night there, and I'll go up in the morning. Well, I, I pulled into a little town called Sedona, Arizona. Yep. And it's right on Oak Creek. with a little creek running through it and everything. And I saw the creek when I pulled in, but I, <clears throat> but it was dark. So I just pulled in, went to bed, pay in the morning like we always do. And I woke up in the morning, opened the door, looked outside, and I saw all these beautiful red rocks and and all of this nature around me. And here's this creek right at my doorstep. And I said, I'm not leaving here. This is like living in a national park. Beautiful. <laughs> so, so I ended up spending two years there. And <clears throat> and while I was there, but I was back in nature. I mean, I was in a nature area, and it's a tourist area there. So everybody that was there was having fun. You mm-hmm. know, it's a tourist town, yeah. and and most of all, it was full of art galleries. Here's the oh, probably wow. twenty art galleries in this town. Perfect. And some of them, some of them were fine arts, and I thought, wow, you know. So I, yeah, I had a little bit of entertainment, and and I could get back into the art scene a little bit, and um, so anyhow, one day. Uh, I had, um, there was an, an exhibit, art exhibit coming to town, and it's relevant to our little story here, okay. uh, an art exhibit coming to town. It was a, 
uh, a young gal from, I think, Poland, and she was very famous, and you're called the young Picasso type. And But I loved her art. And I said to the owner, when I found out she was coming in, uh, <clears throat> I got an invitation, and I said, and I went into her gallery, and it's called the Lanning Gallery in, in Sedona, Arizona, and, and Peggy, and she had must have been 200 light bulbs up above, you know, in a gallery full of all this kind of art that tourists buy and so on. And and here's this special exhibit coming. I, and I looked at her and I said, Peggy, I said, let me do you a favor. I said, I have a little bit of a background in stage lighting when I was a kid. And I said, I, I, this is the type of presentation that you need some special lighting. And she didn't know what I was really talking about, but uh, so anyhow, I ended up talking to her husband and eventually convincing them to let me come in and do the lighting on this event. And so I went in afterwards, closed the door, took everybody out, a large gallery, but I took down every piece of art they had in the, in the building, stacked it away, hid it away, and I took down all of the lighting that they had because they had like 200 light bulbs. And so then when they brought in the art and put the art where they wanted it, and then I started putting up lights one at a time, trying to create presence so that every piece had its own identity, its own space, and it was absolutely beautiful. And afterwards, the lady came, or the owner came in, and she looked at it and she said, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And after that, because of all the art, other local artists our gallery owners came to town. Everybody saw it. Everybody wanted to know who did the lighting. And so all of a sudden, I accidentally ended up in a little business called Best of Show, and I just started doing specialty lighting for art galleries. Yeah, very cool. And it was, they didn't have any money to pay you a lot of money or anything, but but it was what I loved to do. I loved art. So anyhow, so I got back into handling or working with electrical. One day, I was sitting at the computer, and it kept crashing. Back in the, in the late 90s, computers weren't grounded, and so they'd get a lot of glitches and static electricity. You could get a glitch on software, whatever, and it would go down, then you have to restart it and, and back and forth. And I did this a couple of times. and So then I realized it was static electricity, so I took a piece of copper tape, and I laid it across the top of my desk. It was like one-inch copper tape, laid mm -hmm. it across the top of my desk, connected it to an alligator clip and a wire and connected it to the close nearby electrical ground. Then I would touch the copper tape before I touched the computer, discharge the static electricity into the copper tape in the ground. Then I could go type in whatever I wanted. The computer worked fine. And then <clears throat> shortly after that, I put my order in, everything was done. I walked outdoors, sat on a bench uh, in Sedona, and a big tour bus pulls up. And on this tour bus is a group of Japanese tourists. They're a little shorter in stature. And, and they were all wearing big, white, look like Nike tennis shoes. And I thought to myself, there must have been a strip mall back where they had them on sale and everybody bought the same pair yep. because it was so obvious. And, and I didn't think too much about it, but it just crossed my mind. I said, I wonder... I wonder, and this is intuitive, I wonder if there's a consequence to humans wearing these rubber soled shoes because uh, when you wear them, I mean, because of my background, I knew that we were insulated and um, I didn't know and I just thought about it. So I went home that night and I'd been playing with computers and static electricity on before. I went home that night and I took a voltmeter and took a a, like a 30, 40 foot wire, stuck it in to a ground rod, stuck it in the earth, connected to ground rod, it connected it to the meter, and then I walked, put the meter, and took the live probe, and walked around the the house with this meter, and then I could read all the static electricity that was going up and down on my body every step I took, every time I would sit on, you know, the bed had foam and static electricity, and everything on our homes has dissimilar materials, so we have lots of static, uh, static electricity in the homes. You don't see it unless you go touch a doorknob, and you see a spark. If you see a spark, that's three to 5,000 volts, depending wow. on the humidity. So whenever you yeah. get a, ah, that's three to 5,000 yeah. volts. 
Yes. It doesn't have a lot of amperage, <laughs> but they, but there's that much voltage difference. Gotcha. And so you'll get this this spark. And that's huge. That's a, a huge amount of voltage. And and then uh, then you, then you've got all the EMFs. Mm. And most people are worried about the EMFs, but they're only around a volt or two volts, so they're really kind of more noise, what we would call background noise. And um, uh, so, but anyhow, I started, and then when I went up to my bedroom, that's where I found that the EMFs were the highest because, you know, when they build your house, they put up all the two fours, and then an electrician comes by at waist high and drills the holes. They run the wires back and forth to the outlets and up and down and everything. And then they slap up the wall board. Then you put and bring your bed in, put it up against the wall. Your head is about six inches away from a bundle of Romex. Oh so goodness. the most... The most you're ever exposed to EMFs is when you're in bed sleeping because your head's up against the wall. Oh my gosh! But makes but you want anyhow, to turn the pillow I, I, around and put your feet up against the wall. But I, I'm not sure that would help. <laughs> no, that no, wouldn't help because your feet are conductive too. So yes. the, your voltage is going to be the same at your head to your toe because your yeah. body is like is a conductive property. Yeah. People are worried about the metal springs. The springs aren't the problem. It's your body's the problem because right. it's a conductor. Sure. So. But anyhow, I um, <clears throat> I started playing with it, and so that night I thought well, it was still early enough. I, w I made it down to the hardware store, and I bought I went and bought a roll of three inch wide metal aluminum foil duct tape that you would wrap around furnaces. Yeah, and taped it across the bed, connected it to a wire, threw it out the window, stuck it in the ground rod, and then did the same for the voltmeter. And so then I would lay down on the wire, hold the voltmeter in my hand, and then all of these voltages would disappear, which I knew. As long as I was grounded, then all of this uh, noise disappears because when you're connected to the earth, the earth is infinitely large, you know, and your body's infinitely small. So your body's going to equalize with the earth, the electrical of potential of the earth, rather than the environmental uh, noise. <clears throat> so anyhow, I... I I kind of understood all of this from my electromagnetic interference or permit, preventing electromagnetic interference uh, in the communications industry. And static electricity is always popping and always whatever. So grounding is very important. <clears throat> and I had a second nature. Everything in electrical, you ground. So anyhow, I um, was laying there on, the, on this tape, grounded out. This is your meter was reading zero. And I had the meter on my chest, and the next thing I knew, it was morning. The meter was down by my side, and I had fallen asleep. And what was surprising to me was I was 54 years old at that time. I grew up on a, I was a cowboy. I have done everything in broken bones. I've done everything you can imagine. Uh, I skied for 30 years. I played tennis for a couple years, uh, but I'm very active. And <clears throat> at 54, I had a lot of pain in my body, chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time going out the backyard outside this place, and I looked up at the sky and I said, God, why did you make my body with so much pain in it? Because, uh, you know, it was just terrible. And not only that, everybody I knew has pain. Everybody has pain. Nobody can sleep and everybody has pain. And so <clears throat> anyhow... Didn't mean to sidetrack there. But anyhow, so I, I woke up and I said, well, there's something going on here because normally I don't sleep. Normally I have to take Advil or something because I had so much chronic pain. And uh, so I did it for a couple of more nights and I went to sleep. And so it really helped me sleep by being on ground and having skin in touch with this conductive tape. I would just fall asleep within a few minutes. And I was fatigued, tired, and I needed it anyway. But so anyhow, then a couple of days later, I, a couple of friends, um, uh, I said, you know, you guys got to come see this. And I showed them what I was doing. And I said, I, and I, and you sleep better. And, and nobody sleeps. So I said, you know, if you want to try it. So we went over to their houses and took some excess tape, made up a ground plane for them to sleep on, connected it to the ground. And a couple of days later, one of the guys came came over and he said, you know, he says, you do sleep better. This is great. He says, but do you think it can have anything to do with my arthritis? I says, no, I don't think so. I think it's just sleep. 
I think it's just grounding out this environmental noise and that's allowing you to sleep better mm. and, and so on. And, um, um, so all of a sudden the day later, I recognized all my pain, my chronic pain was almost gone. And I thought, wow, there's something really going on here. And back then all there was, was AOL you know, on the internet. Mm. And so I had, I couldn't find anything there. I went to Nexus Lexus to do some data retrieval to find out if there's anything uh, on why grounding the body reduces pain or, or improves sleep. Nothing, nothing anywhere. And so I went down to use or down to, first of all, to University of Arizona, nothing there. Then I ended up going to, uh, to UCLA. I figured I'll go out there. Those guys know everything. And I'll find out uh, what's, you know, figure this out. And, and, and so I packed everything up, went out there, got there that, and made some connections with the sleep lab. And they looked at me, we were sitting around a table. They looked at me and one of the guys says, you, you expect us to believe somebody's going to tie a wire around somebody's toe and stick a nail in the earth and they're going to sleep better. They said, get out of here. You're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> You're going, well, I'm and doing I was... it. You know, so you, you, you go on this um, this research journey, really. And, and, and I guess, you know, um, your research has spanned from getting literally laughed out of, of offices as if you're crazy <laughs> to, you know, right. what today looks like a pretty impressive body of research, you know. But I'm curious, how, how did it feel on those early days when you – you know, you've got something big here, you know, or you're right. Or maybe you hadn't even figured that out yet, but yet people aren't taking no. you seriously. Well, it was <clears throat> when I recognized that three of us had the same result and that pain went away. I said, you know, how come nobody knows about this? How come I didn't know about this? Yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I kept playing with it a little bit. And then I recognized one day, I said, okay, this works, it's real. And it was the greatest day, one of the greatest days of my life in the morning, and one of the worst days of my life at the end of the day, because I realized between a few hours that I had discovered something really important or something profound, let's say. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I realized that I was the only person who knew about it. And so I had to, every person I talked to, I had to start from the beginning and nobody believes it. Nobody would believe it unless they experienced it. If I would take an electrode patch, put it in, the, they had arthritis, take an electrode patch, put it in the palm of their hand, connect it to a ground in five, 10 minutes, the pain went away. And they said, oh my God, I want this. Where do I get this? Wow. <laughs> but but it like had to be wishes. experiential. Nobody would believe what I was saying. They, they only could experience it, then they would believe it. And um, so anyhow, after I went to UCLA, UCLA I, I connected with a couple of the students there and, and you know, they're doing dissertations or whatever. And uh, so I got a little help from them to put together a, how to put together a study. So they told me how to design a study. You got to have like 60 subjects and you got to have 30 of them grounded, 30 of them ungrounded. You got to do this, you got to do that. And so they helped me write all of it. And then I hired a nurse to help with the protocol as far as, uh, you know, you know, taking care of managing the data, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> I didn't know what, the only thing I knew to do was how to create a ground plane, how to put it in the bed, put a wire out the window and stick it, <laughs> stick yeah. it into the earth <laughs> and have people sleep on it. And uh, so it took me quite a while to, to do that, but there was no other way because nobody would believe it. So I had to have more information. They wanted more information. And that's how I ended up with 30, 40 studies. Everybody said, well, we've got to have more information. Yeah. Every guy wants to do it themselves. You know, I said, go do it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, we have a good body of evidence now. But anyhow, so the point was uh, back then, well, in order to get those first 60 subjects, nobody would give me a subject. Nobody would recommend people to participate in the study because I wasn't a doctor. Mm. And um, <clears throat> the keepers of I, all wisdom. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, well, this is important. It's got to be done. So anyhow, but one day I was cutting my, getting my hair cut in Ventura, California, mm. 
and I moved the RV up there, and I kind of wanted to be there because I had a couple of relatives close by. And so I, I was getting my hair cut, and I heard a couple of the ladies talking about pain and couldn't sleep. And I thought, man, this is this is these are the kind of people I need. So I got a hold of it. I talked to the owner after I got my hair cut, and I said, I'm looking for uh, some doing a study that and I need 60 people who have pain or can't sleep. And um, she said, honey, don't worry. I should, how many do you need? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I need 60. And so I, I ended up getting a half a dozen from her. Then I started going from beauty salon to beauty salon because they all kind of knew each other and they all kind of recommended me. And so everybody kind of participated and helped wow. me out. So I ended up with 60 subjects. Wow. So th then we had 30 of them were, they were divided. And nobody knew which ones were live and which ones were dead, except for myself. I mean, which grounding pads worked, which ones didn't. So 30 of them were placebo, 30 of them were ground. Mm -hmm. And so over a period of a month or two, we were able to ground those 60 people. And then, <clears throat> um, and one of the most interesting stories, and it's important to understand how it got here, was that the... Um, I one day I was grounding two. They gave me two pads to go out and do one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and so I went to the house. They were both live pads, and the first house I got to, I went in and measured all the electric fields in the house. There were all. It was a concrete floor. It was an adobe house. There was no carpets. There was no not a lot of wiring or anything, and so I measured the EMF. There was none. I measured the static electricity. There was none. And the bed was on a on a metal frame bed on a concrete floor, so it was almost grounded itself. And so I thought to myself afterwards, I said, this is really a waste of a pad because there's no charge here to mm. ground. <clears throat> and so, but I had to give them a live pad because it was the luck of the draw thing. And <clears throat> so I installed it. The, the guy was about 80 years old. Um, <clears throat> and he had had a lot of health issues but anyhow so didn't think too much about it then went across town and it's same thing about an 80 year old woman who had crippling arthritis in both hands and a lot of pain and um just a lot of challenges and so in order to ground her i her son was there helping and <clears throat> i had to explain to him what i was doing and uh, and then in order to, I always measured the amount of electric fields in the in the home. And here she had the highest amount of electric fields and static electricity that I had measured in any home that out of all the homes we were doing, she was like 20 volts of of EMF, wow. like unreal amounts. And and static electricity was huge because everything was lots of bedding, lots of stuff around, and lit up. and so anyhow. Uh, but she couldn't hold the meter uh, that I because I would always have them hold the meter so I could test their body voltage. And <clears throat> so I had to put an electrode patch on one hand and put an electrode patch on the other and took alligator clip, connected the meter to this hand, connected the ground rod or the ground to this time to make sure that everything was working and not to her, but to know that it went to zero as soon as I grounded her. And after a couple of minutes of explaining it, she and I was talking to her son. She looked looked at me. She says, "Well, this one's working, but this one isn't working." And I says, "What do you mean it's working?" And she said, "Well, the pain's gone here, but this one still has pain." And I said, "Well, it's not supposed to get rid of your pain there. <laughs> that isn't because there was just so." Anyhow, I said, "Okay." So I took the meter and connected it to the one hand, reversed everything, and put the the ground to the other one and a few minutes later she said okay now it's working so i realized that just by connecting her hand to the earth the, the ground via an electrode patch an ekg patch mm -hmm. that the pain disappeared and i said wow this is profound yeah, <laughs> and so so anyhow to, but anyhow so that's how that and then 30 days later when it was all done the study was done they were out collecting the the results just by accident, those two people, I saw those two people's results come in. And I looked at them, I said, there's something seriously wrong here. Because they both had identical results. 
but one of them had no EMFs, no electric fields whatsoever. And the other one had more electric fields than I've ever seen in my life in a home. And I looked at it and looked at it and checked everything, checked the pad, make sure it was not working and so on, or working. And 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 then um, I went home that night and I, so I, I started playing around. Then I, for the first time I recognized, I mean, I put a capacitor in line to find out, you know, what happens when it's just, not a pure ground, but a capacitive ground. Mm -hmm. So the charge was there, but when you disconnect it, the electrons go back to the capacitor. Mm -hmm. And so when I did that, the pain would, didn't go away. Wow, interesting. And it didn't, and then I could, I, I did ways to shield the cable so there was no EMF, no electric field, and back and forth. And I did all these tests and found out that if, if it didn't have a pure ground coming in, that it didn't, the pain would come back or the pain wouldn't go away. So <clears throat> then I recognized that it was, um, that it was the electrical surface charge of the earth, the negative surface charge of the earth, that when you stick a ground rod in the earth, the electri electrons of the earth come up the wire and energize the, bring the, ground plane, the ground, grounding mat to earth potential, meaning it becomes flooded with earth's free electrons, just like the earth itself. So it equalizes with the earth, one and the same as the earth. Then when you lay down on it, then your body equalizes with the earth, meaning you absorb <clears throat> those free electrons from the earth. And that was the start of the story. Wow. Because, <clears throat> uh, and, and it was just by accident. So the story here is all intuitive. Everything happened to me. I, I wasn't smart enough to go figure this out. I was just stumbling along doing one thing after the other, yeah. and this all showed up. And at what so time, how, being, how, uh, how much time had passed now before you made this kind of awakening? I would say a couple, three or four months. Okay, so it was pretty rapid. Yeah, yeah know, it was fairly period. rapid, yeah. And, and so it was just kind of like, and then everybody was into EMF back. So everybody's, oh my gosh, the EMFs are causing this, cell phones are causing that and so on. And I looked, I, I knew that that wasn't the case, but you couldn't tell anybody that. People believe what they believe. Yeah. Never try to change a man's mind. Just leave them go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Show them something new, let them experience it, but don't try to change their mind. And that's kind of, the, so the EMF kind of were always around, but I always knew that it was just, it's the earth. The earth is a, is a huge capacitor. It's charged by the sun. You know, electrons and photons are spewing down. The earth absorbs these electrons and become electrified with the excess electrons. And in fact, all living things on the planet are, are connected to the earth and absorb those electrons, uh, either the photons or from the negative charge of the earth come up into the plants and all these things. So it's all a uh, it, it's all one big electrical <laughs> phenomena, <Wow. laughs> and, and and I just by osmosis kind of knew some of this stuff, and then, but but anyhow, so the whole concept was I spent the next couple of three or four years, uh, I, I found a, a a doctor, a retired anesthesiologist. He just recently retired, board. He wanted something to do. He took interest in what I was doing. And so he did the first study where we, he said, I'm not sure that what you're doing is, is accurate or correct, but he said, I, I'm, I'm interested and I don't have anything to do, so I'll help you figure this out. So we went out and grounded a dozen women and, um, <clears throat> and we measured stress hormone cortisol with uh, saliva, it's kind of slobs, they would chew them. And then we'd take them and put them in a capsule and then freeze them. And <clears throat> You know, I take one measure every four hours, measure their saliva cortisol every four hours for 24 hours. So we had a profile mm -hmm. and then we grounded them for a month, six weeks. And then we went back and did the same thing again. And then we sent them all to the lab, came back from the lab and everybody. Uh, so I took everything and programmed it so I could see, you know, the, um, the ranges and, <clears throat> Before everybody's circadian cortisol secretion profiles, the younger women were very high, very scattered, and the older ladies were more um, 
exhaust. I mean, low, low. I mean, the cortisol was low. I'm talking about in the morning. In the morning, the women get up the high cortisol, and then in, at midnight, they would have higher cortisol. Uh, and it was kind of like spaghetti, right, all over the place. And then we grounded them, and we looked at the grounded ones. They all synchronized into a uniform profile. For at at <clears throat> 9 a.m., they were very high. Then they would drop all the way down to near zero at midnight and then go along to 4 a.m., stay near zero. Then at 4 a.m., they would skyrocket up and reach the highest peak around 6 a.m., and then it would deplete back down again. Wow. And we thought, wow, there, there's something going on. But the thing that stumped us was, was how, you know, there's no mechanism that's no cueing device. What's cueing? What's causing the cortisol profile to there's no light there's no sound what is this about and to make it even more interesting we had three originally we had three stewardesses from new york that were on they would lay over in san diego two or three days a week and somebody we, somehow or another they got into our study and um, <clears throat> and we started measuring their cortisol their cortisol when they would come to town was three hours off mm. Uh, they were in New York cortisol. Yeah. Wow. And here we were, San Diego. Okay. And so then when we would ground them, then we recognized that, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, the cortisol would synchronize wow. to San Diego time. And then we recognized that the jet lag was related to being having your cortisol out of sync. <laughs> your oh, cortisol is high and you're, you know, or low and you're awake trying to yes. operate. You can't. That's right. And, and so on. So we, because cortisol so is kind of, I look at cortisol as the opposite to melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. Yes. If you look at these yes. charts, they kind of do the opposite yeah. things, you know? Yeah. Um, if you're not sleeping at night, if you're not mm -hmm. sleeping at night, you've got elevated cortisol. That's the only reason you don't sleep. Otherwise, sleep's autonomic. Well, gosh, I can speak from personal experience, just from, from trying grounding for the last kind of six weeks, you know? And mm -hmm. sleep... Oh my God. It's, it's just like, isn't it an amazing <laughs> feeling? You wake up feeling calm and rested. And, and yes. even when you sleep like a short night, you know, if I go to bed really late, I'll still wake up early, but I don't have that fe sunken feeling in the eyes. I feel like that was a good night's sleep. And I'm, I'm wondering, right. I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, sure. but, I, but I'm wondering whether there's been any, any research done on, you know, REM versus deep sleep and, and, tracking that because i used to have a fitbit and i would look at how much deep sleep how much rem uh um, right. you know and the deep sleep is is the reparative stuff and i wouldn't be yes. surprised if grounding gives you more deep sleep yeah. no we we did do a sleep study up in um uh reno at a sleep lab at, at the university up there and um it's related to the university anyhow um <clears throat> what we we did find there's some uh, um, a lot of changes, a lot of whatever, but you you do have more REM sleep. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the, the other cueing, I mean, the other thing that we learned over the years, what most people report for the first time in a long time, they start dreaming or they start dreaming in color. And so that's more related to, I think, your deep sleep. I'm not mm. sure. But anyhow, I didn't yeah. follow the sleep trail too long because sleep is subjective yeah no matter no matter what <laughs> yeah uh, this help this helps you sleep but if you got financial challenges or relationship challenges or whatever in the world you know it's fight or flight and elevated cortisol and all those things Fair so enough. sleep is more subjective i, yeah. I need to stay closer to the Fair things enough. i could you can actually uh, measure Fair enough. Um, I, I wonder, Clint, if we could kind of stick, step back a little bit and just talk about some real basics here. Um, like, sure. like what is electricity? And, you know, you hear, just, you know, positive charge, negative charge, um, you know, what is, can you, can you elaborate on that? And we talk about, you know, electrons and protons and neutrons, just so we've got yeah. some grounding. So no pun intended. <laughs> yeah. Ch yeah. Charge is, um, <clears throat> first of all, you have to know that 
uh, the the free electrons and the you know they primarily come from the sun. I mean, you know, it's radiation from the sun. And uh, <clears throat> so, on the sun side of the Earth, when it's hot, you know, the electrons are hitting the Earth or the energy, and and it's you know the temperature goes up, and it's like when you stick your arm, you know, outdoors, you know, it's it's um, it can be uh, it, it's there's no heat coming from the sun. There's only radiation coming from the sun. You stick your arm out the door, and it's the sun hitting the arm that's going to warm the the the, right. the skin. And it's, but there's no heat. There's not heat that's coming. I mean, there's sixty miles up. There's no heat. Thousand yes, miles up. Course. There's no heat. It's frigid. Right. You know, so this is all radiation. I okay. See. So <clears throat> so everybody's worried about radiation. The sun is is the biggest the EMF radiator. in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyhow, but so anyhow, your body is absorbing this. The Earth itself is becoming hot. Uh, it's the surface of the Earth, and so it's the, the exciting electrons and 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 so on, uh, and that makes plants grow. All all these things, you know, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so, but that's where they can. That's the source. The primary source is coming from the Earth and are coming from the Sun. And then the molten core of the Earth is churning, and there's all kinds of heat activity and and whatever. And so I'm sure there's free electrons uh, that rise to the surface from the Earth from that also. So there's an abundance of what we call free electrons on the Earth. These are electrons that aren't attached to a molecule. They can be an ion traveling with the other molecule or other, you know, small molecules and so on. But they're really uh, free electrons that they're they're able to move rapidly and reduce charge. The most common charge that people understand in our environment is lightning. Mm -hmm. Whenever you see lightning, what you have, you have condensation, uh, evaporation, you know, from the sun. It's heating up the water and it's vaporizing and it's rising into the clouds. And so <clears throat> the free electrons, I mean, or the negative electrons uh, are being pushed to the top of the cloud. The positive electrons are down at the bottom of the cloud. And so anyhow, once there becomes a certain amount of uh, differentiation, I, I'm going to get back and clean this up a little bit. <laughs> but you have to have an uh, equal amount of opposite charge in order to reduce charge. So once the charge and the positive charge in the clouds uh, becomes high enough, then the negative charge of the Earth, there will be a crack in the fissure in the plasma, and then electrons go, and you'll see this light, and it discharges the electrical imbalance in the clouds. But here's what this imbalance really is. But that's in nature, that is the primary cause of charge is lightning or right. an electrical atmospheric event uh, or you rub, you know, uh, something uh, like resin on a on wool or fur yeah. that'll create a little bit of static charge. But, so what you're doing, so charge is meaning there's a positive charge and a, and a negative charge. So real simple, take two handfuls of marbles one of them has a hundred marbles, one of them has 50 marbles. So one is charged, we call one charge. This one is short 50 marbles, so it's got a, 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 little, a, a charge. Mm -hmm. That's how we can do it. I see. So if you take 25 marbles from here and put them over here, so there's 75 marbles here, 75 marbles here. Now we've reduced it to there's no difference between them, so there's no charge. Right. Not sure this is the best metaphor to explain it's this, working. but it's but it's really to reduce. I mean, charge is, and this is when we get into inflammation. Is when we really mm. talk about what this is about. Yeah. Um, but 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 in nature, you don't have electrical charges. I mean, the Earth is negative. It's got an abundance of free electrons, and it maintains everything electrically neutral. And and the body itself has a lot of um, you have the oxidative burst, you have immune cells that, mm -hmm. you know, that release reactive oxygen species. These are molecules. Reactive oxygen is a molecule that's electrically charged to the point it, it has enough voltage in it that it can rip an electron from a pathogen and destroy it. That's how our immune system works. That's its job, yeah. 
Yeah, it does its job. And it, but so it, so charge inside the body, the body, nature uses charge in the body to maintain uh, energy, to move energy, to, you know, create ATP, to create, you know, anything is, it's all about pulling electrons apart, you know, the, um, you know, protons and, I mean, it's, how do I say it? How, what's the best way to say this? Um, but, it, you know, it's like creating ATP, you're, you're, you're you're separating um, um, electrons and protons and neutrons, and you're pulling things apart, and then you create energy by putting them back together. Mm. And, and there's processes, all these processes in the body that do that. I, and I'm not a, a you know a scientist and doc, and I don't get into the actual all that stuff. I kind of I I kind of I'm an observer. I watch it all. I know a little bit about everything, enough to be dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so anyhow, but the main thing is in nature, the body, the human body, all plant life, all life involved on this planet, uh, the earth was negative. So it always, whatever evolved, didn't have to worry about oxidation mm -hmm. because the body had, I mean, they, they in nature developed mechanisms to reduce radicals and prevent them from harming, you know, healthy normal cells yeah and um and we'll get into that in a second if we have yeah, enough yeah. time up yeah, here. yeah absolutely um but uh, but so, it's, so in other words like so, literally at, at the cellular you know every cellular function in our body requires this differential between the charge yes. to make everything work and yes. as i understand it then that that leads to potential byproducts that need to be kind of mopped up and calmed down and mother earth just provides that as long as yeah, we're through, touching her yeah, so to speak yeah through throughout all time the human body and all of our progenitors we were naturally grounded we never knew about it we didn't even have to think about it but nature as long as it's grounded then nature could do its magic yeah and create us and create this life that we all know and and that was all fine and and we could go for an hour on that alone but but so let's move fast forward um through all of our studies through everything mm -hmm. and you know there's 50 studies peer-reviewed published on the earthinginstitute.net uh there's the earthing movie there's lots of information out there if you want to learn more about all of this and and um but but now so what happened is as time went on, as humans got smarter, we started creating all of these things, environmental creature comforts. Mm. You know, we create foam beds to sleep on because they're nice and soft and so on, but they insulate us, I mean, insulate us. So, but anyway, I'll back up a little bit. In 1960, about then, prior to 1960, we started wearing rubber sole shoes for especially for work and and so on and then they came along kids shoes they were a popular uh kind of a maybe a tennis shoe but and then all of a sudden in 1960 when we invented the polymers then we could mass produce um plastics mm. but prior to that time the only thing that really ever insulated us from I mean, we were if we wore a leather sole shoe we were naturally grounded because the perspiration in your from your foot hydrates the sock hydrates the leather and it holds the body salts and so a shoe right. is some is a semiconductive right. and so we were always kind of naturally grounded and then we start putting the rubber on and that began to insulate there's mm -hmm. it's like an electrical jacket on a wire yep. it's not going to get shocked because the wire is going to protect you so <clears throat> then we started uh, but when we invented the synthetic plastics 1960 about the first thing we did with those is we put them on the soles of shoes because before then rubber was relatively expensive leather was expensive and so on and most people were barefoot in the world mm -hmm. and but now with these synthetic plastics they can make shoes for everybody and they were inexpensive and it didn't matter if they got wet yeah. <laughs> and so it was a great and a great achievement a great advancement now everybody can afford shoes Everybody can wear shoes, yeah, and, and so on. So in 1960, about also about that time, 90% of the visits 
this is, I, I, I need to document this a little bit more, but 90% of the visits to a general practitioner were in were infectious disease, acute injury, and childbirth. And then a few others, mm. you know. But today, 90% of all visits to a practitioner are for an inflammation-related health disorder. Mm. Now, if you think in the last 60 years, this is only 60 years that we invented all these plastics. But in the last 60 years, the medical you know, community, you know, the, you, the institutions, mm -hmm. medical in the United States is like 30% of the gross national product. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. crazy. Um, but anyhow, so our whole economy depends on the medical system mm -hmm. and it really does. And inflammation. Because if everybody, <laughs> if everybody got well, then all the docs would be out of work. Yeah. We'd be, yeah. So okay. there are issues, you know, with all this. And I'm not putting anybody down. I won't. That's not what this is about. Yeah. But so anyhow, we had a dramatic shift that occurred in 1960, and a lot of people said, "Well, it's EMF, or it's this, or it's that, or it's whatever, or it's, you know, we developed polio shot, we developed all those things, you know, and the uh, penicillins and." All of these things came along, and but yet everybody's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. People are living longer, but the quality of life has diminished significantly. And so, anyhow, so what happened? What? Um, and and again, this is cowboy logic. Going back to the cows, you know, health is the body's most natural state. Mm -hmm. You have to screw up the body you have to interfere with the body's immune system or its ability to maintain health otherwise the body only knows to do one thing restore health and maintain health so something changed i knew nothing about any of this but it is interesting this is only 60 some years ago that this yeah. happened yeah, yeah. and then came along phil knight and made shoes you know tennis, nikes and all those and so the world really changed rapidly and today People live in shoes. They mm -hmm. wear shoes from the time they get up to the time they go to bed. So what happened, and this is kind of what, you know, I, I'm getting lost here a little bit, but along the way, um, I didn't know that in the beginning when I was doing these studies. I just had to go backward and paste this together. What mm -hmm. was the cause of all this inflammation? Because everybody wanted to know if you're reducing pain, you have to be reducing inflammation. And we didn't know that until 204 because the word inflammation wasn't common in the literature no. or in the language mm -hmm. before 204. Yes. And, and so, so anyhow, as Stephen Sinatra, who was a cardiologist, you know, was the one that informed me, he says, Clint, he said, if you're affecting pain, you need to be researching inflammation. And I said, well, what's inflammation? It means you break an ankle and it swells up. And he said, well, that's kind of it. But then he said, there's a different kind. And he said, you need to be researching inflammation. He said, you can't have pain unless you have inflammation. If you have pain, then you your body's on fire. Yeah. <laughs> pain is a message. Get your to get me out of here. <laughs> Do something different because I'm on fire. Right. But the body, so so anyhow, that's that he was the first one to it was 204 i've been doing research for six years prior to that wow. and uh but then once i recognized or once he told me that then i started doing some research and i found out that the white blood cells um the immune system white blood cells primarily neutrophil if you have a pathogen in your body and a neutrophil somehow is going to be attracted to that pathogen, probably a radio signal of some kind or a cellular signal of some mm -hmm. kind. Um, and it's recognizing that pathogen and it's swimming over there. It's going to find it and it gets up close to it and it wraps itself. It's kind of a jelly cell. It kind of wraps itself around the pathogen and then it releases what we call reactive oxygen species. The word reactive means it's electrical, meaning it's it maintains a, an extremely large, large charge, thousands and thousands, way above static electricity, thousands of volts. So a radical, wow. the word radical, re, word radical means it can steal an electron. Not many things can steal an electron. Right. Um, ionization, you know. Yes. So, <clears throat> so 
So anyhow, here's this little molecule in the body that the neutrophil is releasing. So it's going over and it's ripping electrons away from the pathogen. And that's how the immune system destroys pathogen. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. So the immune so the immune system is, uh, to me, I'm electrical guy. Well, how come people don't know the immune system is electrical? They didn't at the time. I'm sure they did. Some people do. The scientists do and so on. But the general practitioners and population, no. So, but the body, so to me, the body's electrical first, chemical second. Every cell in the body operates, functions electrical. That means cells repolarize and depolarize and take food in, put, take things out. But it's, those are all electrical phenomena. So everything in the body is electrical first. Everything that makes up life is energy first. Anyway, we are pure energy. Of course. And, and uh, so, <clears throat> so anyhow, then... So why, so still we had the issue of inflammation. Why, why was, what was causing the oxidation of these cells? So then it's when I realized that if I ground somebody to the earth, it's like pouring water on a fire. It's oxidation, fire is oxidation, inflammation is oxidation. So I said, electrons are, when I, or electrons into the body via a, a electrode patch or just having them lay on a ground grounding mat, then those electrons are being absorbed by the body, equalizing with the earth. And once it reaches earth potential, you can't have inflammation in a grounded body, in a grounded wow. plant, a grounded cow, or anything else, a grounded computer. Mm. That's what grounding is all about, is to prevent charge. Yes. And is this so why my then, is this why then there was that anomaly where the, the one house was just off the chart lit up and the other house had yeah. nothing but it was right. it was still just quenching that fire yeah. it was absorbing electrons from the earth those electrons went into the body they reduced all of the remaining radicals so what's happening is the immune system you know uh, uh, a neutrophil releases the Oxidation, oxidative radicals, the radicals go in and do the oxidative burst, wipe out the pathogen. And then if there's any remaining radicals left after that oxidative burst that aren't being used up by reduction, then <clears throat> they're going to rip an electron from something in nanoseconds. These are electrically charged hot molecules. They're going to steal an electron from something rather instantly. So they, what's the closest thing? It's another cell. So it's going to go over and, and uh, rip an electron from a healthy cell, damage it. Message goes back to the immune system. Hey, something's still here getting me. Now the neutrophil comes over. And so you set up a chain reaction. Yes. That's what you call it. That's how you start a fire. You have a chain reaction. You have chronic oxidation. You have chronic oxidation here. So now you have heat. You have oxidate. You're burning. So yeah. now... <clears throat> I, it's it, cowboy logic. I'm pouring water on a fire. Yeah, I love it. I mean, that's that's you know, this is what we're talking about: oxidative stress, where where the reactive oxygen species kind of overwhelm the body's antioxidant defenses, causing yes. oxidative damage, and you're right. you're literally putting out the fire. So, yeah, um, amazing. So so um, so you're you're now realizing inflammation oxidative stress um you know you you did some studies around chronic stress and cortisol alignment um, i'm curious yes. to ask you about z what you know about zeta potential okay well the, what we did in and steven sinatra got involved in gaetan chevalier who's a physicist they were the ones who put this together <clears throat> but anyhow so what we what we, we cardiologists Thick, sticky blood, that's their big issue. Yes. Inflammation, if you, you know, it's all, it's all built around that. So we ended up doing a study um, where we went in and we measured the electrical potential of red blood cells prior to grounding. And then after we grounded them for a half hour, hour, whatever. And so what we learned was as soon as you ground the body, then the red blood cells, you have an increase of a, almost 300% increase in the negative surface charge on red blood cells that means you increase the red the red blood cells you know 
that's a huge percentage. Mm. It would be down and you know, normally the average person is around five percent, you know, five negative five millivolts. But as soon as you ground them for a few minutes, then they're gonna jump up to fifteen millivolts negative. So now these little red blood cells are negatively charged, and now they are like little uh, metaphor would be magnets. They, they, you push little negative magnets together, they, they will push each other apart. Right. So now all the red blood cells, there's no more rouleau formation. There's no more stickiness. The red blood cells get, they push each other apart. Now the blood is thin, can get in and out of the capillaries. A person turns pink within five or four or five minutes after they ground wow. because the, the, the circulation um, improves so significantly. Wow. And, and, so it just and, massively and the information blood flow. And, and that, of course, yeah, yeah. delivers oxygen and nutrients much more easy to the tissues. Yeah. Yeah. And then the inflammation drops within a few minutes later. Wow. So, that, that, um, so if you, that could be the most powerful of the whole lot. But um, I'm, I'm. Well, that is. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm but, curious. But again, sorry. Sorry, Clint. Go ahead. It's nature. It's nature. We put our feet back on the earth. The body equalizes with the earth, and you can't have inflammation in a grounded object. And to put this in perspective, the animals who live in the wild, they don't, I mean, the inflammation, I mean, or uh, cancer is, is almost unheard of in the natural world. Yeah. You have now, to go destroy their environment. But yeah. in the animals who live indoors with their owners, 50% of them die from cancer just like their owners. Yeah. That's a huge business. So the, you know, now, this now is in, you know. This is an environmental health disorder. Yes. Everybody's worried about what they're eating, all those kind of things, but we accidentally lost our ground. This thing that maintains the electrical stability of the body, primarily the immune system. We lost the electrical stability that maintains the ability for the immune system to function as it was designed in nature. Right. And now it's running hot and it's oxidizing and burning up the body. Wow. And, and um, you know, Run through some of the conditions that you've seen. I'm sure they're in the hundreds that that improve when you ground properly. Well, it's like I, I tell everybody. I mean, I'll give you an example. Like MS is a very common one. That's the one I started out with a lot with the women. They were the ones the radiology or the uh, anyhow the. the they would, the, the docs would give me because they say, you see if you can help, <laughs> we're tired of them. But anyhow, um, <clears throat> so I could take a woman eventually after I, you know, I just put an electrode patch in her hand. And usually they have, you know, loss of control, muscle control and all that. And I would just put a, an electrode pen, patch in the hand. I did this early on. And then within a few minutes, the pain would start coming way down. That was the um, <clears throat> reactive, I mean, the electrons reducing the reactive uh, oxygen species, mm -hmm. reducing them. And, and, and then after that, um, the circulation would begin to improve because their blood was thin and they would start turning pink. Their demeanor would change. They're, they weren't in, in as much pain. And, and then just all of a sudden, they would just kind of be, be happier, a little happier. But anyhow, I did, I have grounded people with MS for almost 20 some years. And you know, I can honestly take a woman today and put a patch in her hand and five minutes later, and say, you no longer have MS. What you have now is damage from MS. Right. Of course. But as long as you get grounded and stay grounded the rest of your life, you'll never have MS again. Wow. And and so that's a hard thing to say, but but it, but you, and they have to experience it. But it doesn't matter. It's anything that we have. I mean, it's like I, I could go on. It's like. COPD. I put a, an electrode patch here and an electrode patch here. Five minutes later, they can breathe like they're like a teenager on the on the on the ball field. Um, so what did I do? You, when you you know they're suffering from cytokine storms, you know a chronic cytokine storm in the lungs, and so as soon as you put a patch here and patch here, it's like you're filling them with free electrons. So it instantly stops the cytokine storm, wow. and then they can start breathing. It doesn't mean they have full capacity, but then a few years later, they will have full capacity if they get ground, stay ground, because wow. the, the lungs will heal up. And, and I could go on and on. I don't want to touch on anything that's too political or anything, but yeah. but <clears throat> but COPD, if you got to carry over a COPD, just put a patch on it and take wow. five minutes.
Uh, wow. Or go outdoors. Go outdoors. Put your bare feet on the earth. If you can, put your hands and your bare feet on the earth. It's just sit there. And if, and if you have a chance, get a little bit of sunlight while you're doing it, because that's the other problem. We lost our vitamin D because we put roofs over our heads. Mm. Yes. <laughs> we, we've removed ourselves from nature. Yes, we are nature. We are nature. You know, and I'll say this about, you know, it's like cancer, you know, and, and, and a lot of people have significant remission from many, many things uh, when you ground because you can't have most of these health disorders unless you have chronic inflammation for an extended period. Mm. And they build up over times and years and so on. And it's like certain uh, cancers, they go in and, you know, they they're, they're, they develop within a pocket of inflammation. And they de differentiate from the other cells and then they become a, uh, you know, a um, their own thing. And, and then they get their own blood cell or supply and whatever. But if you can go in there and reduce the inflammation that's protecting it, then eventually the immune system will get to it. And what does an immune system do? It will reduce it. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And so, so Clint, um, where do you think this is headed? You know, as as a as a movement. You know, what what would you like to see? I'm, I'm you know, in terms of the research, if money was no object and you could wave a magic wand, you know, because this is obviously hugely powerful and the word needs to get out. And obviously, we need more and more research. Yeah, we, we do. And to me, I, I work primarily with the 35 to 55 year old moms because they're taking care of their children, uh, one or two who are on the spectrum who shouldn't be. Uh, that's an inflammation related health disorder also. Um, <clears throat> or their moms who are on a dozen drugs that they have to manage for them and so on. So these moms in the middle I, who I try to work with the most and, and then I tried to work younger as mm -hmm. much as possible. I love to work with the children because they 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 get this, um, but but where does it need to go from here? It's really what I do as education. I'm not. I was just a, a free spirit that I stumbled into enough money when I was young enough that I was able to go do all this yeah. stuff, and and um, uh, and I and I I'm just one of those people. I just when you find something that is like this, you just love it. You can't not yeah. get up in the morning and not do this. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, the research, it's all I've done is not, I never did a, a lot in the way of um, clinical studies. I primarily focused on uh, proof of concept. Ground the body and something happens. Do this, something happens. So that means that everything is affected. Everything in the body is systemic. And so you affect it here as you're going to affect it everywhere. And grounding is one of those things that affects everything. So the number one thing, it's about electrical still better. No matter what you eat, no matter what you believe, no matter all these things out there. I'm not saying that I, I know I could get into that for hours, but, but the number one thing you have to do is teach people to restore their ground uh, if they're in trouble. Then beyond that, it's about education. People need to spend, a, a woman needs to spend at least a half hour to an hour a day with her bare feet on the earth just to drain out the elevated cortisol that she's got from all the, 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 the chronic stress that she's in all day. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, our, it's our sympathetic nervous system and our elevated, chronically elevated cortisol that is behind all of this. But if you're grounded, you ground out that inflammation and stress and you can put up with it and cope with it longer before it eats you up. But there's a much more to the story here. <laughs> much I, more. I, I, I'm, Clint, I would like to talk to you for, for just, you know, over time and just get even more because it, it is such oh, I, a powerful story. And I'm sure you got a lot more to, more to tell us. Um, what about um, you know what what how can people find out more about you and your research and the products that you and your, and your company are involved in? Yeah, well, in uh, the, basically the Earthing book, uh, it's just Earthing book. We call it the most important health discovery ever, and the reason we say most important because it's free. All you have to do is go outdoors, put your feet on the earth, and Mother Earth will heal you. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. And so that's what that message is about. It's not that we're, you know, more important than this or that. 
Uh, <clears throat> but the Earthing book is available everywhere. It's there's well over a million copies in print now in many languages. And um, the Earthing movie, which is free on YouTube, um, and there's a 15 minute down to earth pre uh, uh, preview of the Earthing movie that's also on YouTube. Um, those will give you a nice overview, and they're they're stories about people, and they're all authentic. They're all you know 100 percent what what you see, and um, uh, it's. What can I say? Then the Earthing Institute, if you want to see, there's like 100 different papers of some kind. Uh, there's 40, 50 peer-reviewed published studies, papers. Uh, there's uh, lots of commentaries. There's lots of uh, reports from people. Uh, like if you have a certain health disorder, you want to find out who, go to Google and type it in. Type in the word inflammation, type in your your issue and type in earthing or grounding and see what comes up. There's a, it's, it's kind of taken on a life. It's, wow. it's coming. It must be so satisfying to, to see that. And it, and of course there are products, right? I mean, if you don't have access to green grass or whatever, you can buy mattresses and sheets and pillowcases and patches and things to, to ground your home. Yeah. Right. The, in, in Europe, I mean, you can, in Europe, you can go to the earthing, I think it's earthing revolutions, what she calls herself. Um, in the United States, it's earthing.com, or earthing.com will take you to all of them. Um, but basically, those are simple products. And what I tried to do was, uh, <clears throat> is once we started doing their research, then we realized that people were getting benefit and they kept coming back. They wanted to take the mats home with them, or they wanted to come back and get extra mats for their friends or their primarily their moms. And, and uh, so then we accidentally ended up in a business making these mats are 12 inches wide and 30 inches long. That's the one we sell millions of. And it's on well under $100 or whatever. And it's got all the material with it. And then we started making the sleep mats. Because the one thing we ask ourselves is, what's the number one thing we can do for people? And because they don't like to follow protocol. They don't like to do anything, you know, too long. So so we said, well, let's, let's give them a mat to sleep on because that way they don't have to do anything. Just put it on their bed, then go home and then at the end of the day, lay down and go to sleep like they normally do. And so they don't have any any overhead or any excess challenges they have to put up with. And so that's what we did. And so the two products that we have are really a large mat that you can use anywhere called a uni mat. I think it sells for $59 or something like that. And then you've got the sleep mats that, can be the size of your bed uh, individually or just a half a bed. And uh, they sell a kit that's got half a dozen things in it for $149 or something, all kinds of, but anyway, so what I've, to me, this is an educational movement. So it's about, it's a mission. It's not about, it's not about going out and getting rich. This is too important. This has got to be made to everybody as much as possible as, and as freely as possible. I can't do much more free stuff, but um, <clears throat> but it's it, it needs to you know it's like the docs have to understand it because you're going to have better outcomes, you know, yeah. if you can ground some of these people, and 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 um, it, it's it's a big challenge. Just like when we built the cable industry, it took us sixty years. It's going to take sixty years. Well, I've already got twenty in it. <laughs> it's going to take another 40 years for this to be incorporated into other people. Oh, but God. it's up to the people. It's up to the practitioners. And I'm not saying it's it's, it's beneficial. It's, um, you know, it's, I tell everybody, just, just go outdoors, put your bare feet on the earth, start there. If your pain starts to come down, then do a little more and stay there until your pain goes away. <laughs> I tell you. Because that's how you're... That's it. I mean, I, I can only speak from my own experience in a relatively short period of time. You know, I've just, I mean, I'm, I'm a trained nutritional therapist. And, um, and so right. I've only really just come across this in the last six weeks. And, and oh, wow. know, I'm sleeping better. Um, uh, I've had some chronic pain in my hip and my lower back. And it's like not as much there. And uh, I, I've, I was just saying to my... Uh, my fiance, I'm getting married in a week's time from today. In fact. Oh, congratulations. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I was just saying, you know, 
life hasn't slowed down. There's still stress swarming all around me, but I don't feel as stressed, you know? Right. Um, and I go back and think about all the clients that I've seen, and I was like, my God, you know, this, this could be the, the missing piece for them. So I'm yeah. really excited about this, and, and uh, hence me reaching out to you. And, and I just want to say on behalf of the College of Naturopathic Medicine, I want to thank you so much for your generosity of, of time today and just enormous gratitude for the work that you and your company are doing uh, for the health of the planet, really. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me and allowing me to share. And, um, you know, just I, I, I could talk for days on this because of all my experience. And but again, it's it's common sense. We all have this. We all know this. If we'll take time and just listen to our bodies, our bodies know this. Yes, they and do. and I'm and I'm with you. It's sunlight, nutrition, and now ground. I mean, we have to have those things. Without them, we're in trouble. Yes. Other than that, health. Other than that, health is free. Beautiful. What a great way to uh, to end this wonderful discussion. Thanks, Clint. It's been great talking to you. Have a you good bet. rest of the day. All right. Namaste. Take care. Namaste. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to subscribe to keep up to date with all our episodes, which can also be found on the CNM website.